Hello everybody and welcome to our module on gastric disorders. Before we talk about specific gastric disorders, let me review some vocabulary that you need to understand in order to appreciate stomach diseases. So the term gastritis means inflammation of the mucosa, and this is often a generalized gastritis covering much of the stomach mucosa, although sometimes it can also be localized to one particular area. An erosion is a loss of the epithelial layer of the mucosa of the stomach. It may extend into the muscularis mucosa, but importantly, it does not break through the muscularis mucosa. If it breaks through, then that is an ulcer. So an ulcer is an erosion or a breakdown that has gone all the way through the mucosal layer so that the stomach has lost a portion of the mucosal layer. It can extend into the submucosa or the muscular layer. It's usually focal, and these mostly occur in the stomach and duodenum, as we'll see later in this module. And what can be confusing about the terms I've listed on this slide is that gastritis, erosions, ulcers can all have similar symptoms and even sometimes treatment. So we'll talk about at the end of this module how you sort out the different causes of stomach disorders. So we'll begin by talking about gastritis, which is inflammation of the gastric mucosa. And gastritis can be either acute or chronic. And whether it is acute or chronic is basically defined by the type of infiltrate seen on biopsy. So acute gastritis has a neutrophilic infiltration, and chronic gastritis has an infiltrate made up of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. Acute gastritis is usually mucosal damage from acid. We'll talk about that in a minute. There are many causes. Chronic gastritis basically has two common causes. One is an autoimmune disorder, and the other is the bacteria H. pylori. When gastritis is symptomatic, the symptoms are usually called dyspepsia. This means nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, sometimes abdominal or epigastric pain, the symptoms are often worsened by food because when you eat, that stimulates more acid secretion and more acid secretion damages the mucosa further. So for step one of the boards, they will be much less likely to ask you to name causes of acute gastritis. They will be much more likely to ask you if you understand the mechanism by which the mucosa becomes inflamed. So let's review some general points about acute gastritis. The epithelium produces mucus and bicarb and this protects the mucosa. And in order for this to happen, there has to be normal blood flow to the stomach and the mucosal layer. Inflammation can occur when too much acid is produced or if for some reason the protection of the mucosa is lost. So all the causes of acute gastritis will either involve too much acid production or the loss of protection of the mucosa. This is a slide from one of our GI physiology modules and I just want to review how the parietal cell secretion of acid in the stomach is regulated. So recall that acetylcholine, histamine, and prostaglandins can all influence the secretion of acid via parietal cells. Acetylcholine and histamine stimulate acid production, which is bad from the point of view of gastritis. Prostaglandins, on the other hand, inhibit acid production, which is good from the point of view of gastritis. And these concepts will be important as we talk about the various causes of acute gastritis. And just to review where the parietal cells that secrete acid are found, they are found in both the fundus and the body of the stomach, they're usually not found in the antrum of the stomach, which is the portion right before the pylorus. So acute gastritis, as I said before, is acute inflammation of the mucosal layer of the stomach, and it will present with symptoms of dyspepsia. And I've listed on this slide some of the common causes of acute gastritis. The first one is use of NSAIDs. NSAID drugs inhibit prostaglandin production, so this will increase acid production from the parietal cells. In addition, prostaglandins promote mucus and bicarb production, so when you inhibit prostaglandins, you will reduce the amount of mucus and bicarb produced in the stomach. An NSAID-induced acute gastritis is common among chronic NSAID users, so people with inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or chronic back pain who take NSAIDs every day are at risk for acute gastritis from NSAID use. Alcohol can also cause acute gastritis. Alcohol can directly damage the mucosal layer of the stomach. Some chemotherapy drugs will inhibit epithelial cell replication. This can cause a loss of protective layer in the stomach. And then finally, H. pylori can cause acute gastritis. Now we will talk later about how bacterial infection with H. pylori is a very important cause of chronic gastritis and ulcers. However, there are data that suggest when you are initially infected with H. pylori, it can cause an acute gastritis as well as chronic gastritis and ulcers. A Curling's ulcer is another form of acute injury to the stomach lining that occurs in burn patients. Patients with extensive skin burns have loss of their skin, obviously, and this leads to loss of fluids and dehydration. Dehydration is one of the biggest problems in patients with extensive burns who are cared for in burn units. This can lead to hypotension to the stomach and mucosal damage. Remember what I said before, you need normal blood flow to the stomach in order to maintain the mucosal lining. 
The result is acute gastritis and ulcers, and these ulcers are called curling ulcers. And I've written this at the bottom of the screen to help you remember it. Burns lead to decreased plasma volume, which leads to decreased mucosal perfusion. And any patient in the hospital with extensive burns is usually placed on a proton pump inhibitor in order to reduce the risk of Curling's ulcers. A Cushing's ulcer is also an acute injury to the stomach lining, but this is caused by increased intracranial pressure, such as from a tumor or a hemorrhage into the brain. This results in increased vagal stimulation, which leads to increased acetylcholine to the stomach. And remember what I said before, acetylcholine promotes acid production in the parietal cells. So patients with increased intracranial pressure have excess acid production, and this can lead to gastritis and ulcers. And ulcers that occur in this setting are called Cushing's ulcers. So as I've shown at the bottom of the screen, raised intracranial pressure leads to increased vagal tone, which leads to high acetylcholine secretion onto the parietal cells. And just like with patients who have burns, patients with increased intracranial pressure are often placed on proton pump inhibitors to prevent this from happening. Stress ulcers are another form of acute injury to the lining of the stomach. This happens to patients with shock or sepsis or trauma. Any of these causes can lead to poor perfusion of the mucosa of the stomach. And as we talked about before with the burn patients, this leads to a loss of the protective barrier of mucus and bicarb. This is common among patients who are critically ill in the ICU. And as a result, most patients in the ICU are placed on prophylactic therapy with proton pump inhibitors. I've mentioned this before with the Curling's ulcers and the Cushing's ulcers, but you also do this to prevent stress ulcers. Drugs like pantoprazole and omeprazole are used, and this is often administered to all ICU patients. Now let's move ahead and talk about chronic gastritis. So there are basically two forms of chronic gastritis. The first form is called type A. It is an autoimmune disease. The second form is called type B. It is caused by a bacterial infection with H. pylori. And both forms of chronic gastritis may cause dyspepsia. However, oftentimes both forms are asymptomatic until some complication develops. So as we'll see, patients with type B can develop ulcers and patients with type A can develop anemia. And sometimes patients are asymptomatic until the ulcer or the anemia occurs. So we'll talk about the type A or autoimmune form of chronic gastritis first. This is sometimes referred to as pernicious anemia. In this form of gastritis, there is autoimmune destruction of gastric parietal cells. And gastric parietal cells recall secrete intrinsic factor, which is necessary so that vitamin B12 can be absorbed in the terminal ileum. Therefore, if you have this form of chronic gastritis, you can become deficient in vitamin B12, and that can lead to anemia. And years ago, this anemia was uniformly fatal. That's how it got its name, pernicious anemia. The word pernicious means deadly. So this form of chronic gastritis leads to chronic infiltrates in the gastric body and fundus. And it's very important to remember that it affects the body and fundus because that differentiates it from the type B chronic gastritis that we'll talk about in a minute. So the fundus in the body here are predominantly affected by autoimmune gastritis, and that should make sense to you because that's where the parietal cells are found. This is a more common condition among women, and that's true of most autoimmune disorders. It's associated with several HLA-DR antigens, and importantly, it's associated with gastric adenocarcinoma. We'll talk about this in a minute, but the chronic inflammation from this disorder can lead to stomach cancer. Now let's talk about the type B form of chronic gastritis, and that is the type caused by the bacteria Helicobacter pylori. H. pylori is the most common cause of chronic gastritis. This is far more common than the autoimmune type. H. pylori is a gram-negative rod. It can cause both acute and chronic gastritis. As I told you before, you can have an acute gastritis from H. pylori, but it also causes chronic gastritis. It also causes ulcers, and it mostly occurs in the antrum of the stomach, and this helps to differentiate it from the autoimmune form. Remember what I told you before, the autoimmune form happens in the fundus in the body, but H. pylori infection typically occurs in the antrum. This is a picture of H. pylori bacteria shown on the screen here. What's interesting about this bacteria is it does not invade the mucosa. It sits on top of the epithelial cells and secretes a protective barrier so that it can live in the high acid environment of the stomach. The reason that H. pylori can survive in the stomach is because it has an enzyme called urease. What urease does is hydrolyzes urea, which goes on to produce ammonia, and then ammonia becomes ammonium, which leads to production of an alkaline environment. This protects the bacteria from stomach acid. In addition, the ammonium forms ammonium chloride, which is damaging to the stomach. And then because H. pylori creates an alkaline environment, this raises the pH. The stomach senses this and releases gastrin, and that leads to more acid production. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is the structure of urea. Urease essentially splits this, that leads to production of ammonia, which is NH3. That binds with protons and forms ammonium, which is NH4. And this creates an environment that is relatively alkaline, and that's the environment surrounding the H. pylori bacteria. There are two malignancies associated with H. pylori infection of the stomach. The first one is gastric adenocarcinoma, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
The second one is a rare B-cell cancer called MALT lymphoma. MALT stands for mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. It's a B-cell cancer that usually occurs in the stomach and it is highly associated with H. pylori infection. There are a number of ways to make the diagnosis of an H. pylori infection. One way is to perform a biopsy of the lining of the stomach. This is usually done via endoscopy. This is where the physician inserts a camera through the mouth into the stomach and then takes a sample of the lining of the stomach. Another way to make the diagnosis is called the urea breath test. In this test, the patient swallows urea that is labeled with an isotope of carbon, either carbon-14 or carbon-13. If you look at the urea molecule on the bottom of the screen, it's got a carbon in the center of it. If you create urea molecules where that carbon is an isotope, either carbon-14 or 13, then you can detect that isotope after the urea is split. That will become a molecule of CO2, and the CO2 will have the carbon-13 or 14 for its carbon. So in this test, the patient swallows urea labeled with an isotope, and then you detect the isotope labeled carbon dioxide when it's exhaled in the breath. And if you are able to detect it, it means that the urea was split. It means that urease is present in the stomach, and that implies that H. pylori is in the stomach. And then finally, there is a stool antigen test, which is the way that H. pylori is more commonly detected. This is easy to perform clinically with a sample of stool. The classic treatment for an H. pylori infection is triple therapy. It's poorly responsive to any single antibiotic, and the best therapy is one that includes three drugs. One is a proton pump inhibitor, the other is an antibiotic like corythromycin, and the third element is an antibiotic like amoxicillin or metronidazole. This combination has been shown to be the most effective in eradicating the bacteria. You often perform testing to confirm that the bacteria has been eradicated. Remember that I told you patients can have an asymptomatic infection with H. pylori, so you want to make sure the bacteria is gone so that the patient doesn't develop more chronic gastritis, which can potentially lead to cancer. So eradication is confirmed with either a breath test or a stool antigen or a biopsy. And there are lots of treatment failures. About 20% of the time, the triple therapy doesn't work. And treatment of patients who have failed initial therapy is complex. There are numerous alternative regimens that are tried to try and get the bacteria out of the stomach. So back to this slide of chronic gastritis, we've now talked about the two forms. Type A is the autoimmune form, which results in pernicious anemia and affects the body and fundus of the stomach. Type B is the bacterial form with H. pylori. It can lead to ulcers. It affects the antrum of the stomach, and it is associated with malt lymphoma. And both types of chronic gastritis are associated with adenocarcinoma of the stomach. The reason both forms of chronic gastritis can lead to gastric cancer is because the chronic inflammation can lead to what's called intestinal metaplasia. This is where the stomach tissue changes to look like intestinal tissue. The condition is called metaplastic atrophic gastritis. It's called metaplastic because metaplasia is occurring, and it's called atrophic because atrophy is usually seen of the stomach lining from the chronic inflammation. And a very important and high-yield pathfinding to know about in intestinal metaplasia of the stomach is the presence of goblet cells. If you look at this biopsy specimen on the screen here, it's hard to appreciate because it's small, but there are goblet cells appearing in the stomach, and that is evidence of intestinal metaplasia. You can also see inflammatory cells in the lamina propria from chronic gastritis. Now we're going to talk about peptic ulcer disease. And remember what I told you before, an ulcer is a portion of the stomach or the intestine where the mucosal layer has been lost. Usually patients with peptic ulcer disease develop a solitary ulcer. They most commonly occur in the proximal duodenum. 90% of ulcers occur in the duodenum. We'll talk about why in a minute. A smaller number, about 10%, occur in the antrum of the stomach. So if you look at this picture here, just remember that peptic ulcer disease all occurs in this portion of the stomach and small intestine. They are very rare in the body or the fundus of the stomach. They can occur in the antrum, and most commonly, they occur in the proximal duodenum. H. pylori infection is an important risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. As we talked about before, in the setting of H. pylori infection, you can have increased acid secretion, and that can destroy the mucosal layer of the stomach or the duodenum. NSAIDs are also an important risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. Patients who take NSAIDs have breakdown of the protective lining of the stomach of the intestine. And then finally, Smoking is a well-described risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. The mechanism of this is not clear. Most of the patients you see clinically with peptic ulcer disease will have duodenal ulcers, and they will almost always be caused by H. pylori. As I told you before, duodenal ulcers are the most common type of ulcer, and H. pylori is almost always the cause. H. pylori can increase gastric acid production, especially if the infection is limited to the antrum. Remember that the antrum of the stomach, the portion right before the pylorus, is where the G cells are present that secrete gastrin. So if H. pylori is infecting there and creating that alkaline environment, those G cells will sense that alkaline environment and they will increase their gastrin release and this will create lots of acid in the stomach. 
that acid will then roll down across the pylorus and cause an increase in acid presence in the proximal duodenum, and that's where the ulcer will form. Normally, any acid that reaches the duodenum is quickly neutralized. However, in the setting of H. pylori infection, there's too much acid. The duodenum can't neutralize it quickly enough, and the proximal portion of the duodenum is exposed to a high acid environment, and that's what leads to the production of duodenal ulcers. A rare cause of duodenal ulcers is something called the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. This occurs when there is a gastrin-secreting tumor. These tumors create significant acid production from the stomach and often lead to multiple ulcers in the duodenum. In addition, because there is so much acid production in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, the acid rolls down past the proximal duodenum into the distal duodenum or even the jejunum. So a classic finding in a patient with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is to have multiple ulcers present in the distal duodenum or the jejunum. The bulb of the duodenum is the initial portion right here beyond the pylorus. When you see that ulcers are found beyond the bulb, that is something that can occur in the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Also, ulcers in the jejunum almost always occur only in the setting of the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. The symptoms of a duodenal ulcer are epigastric pain, and typically it improves with meals. The reason for this is because meals stimulate bicarbonate secretion. The hormones secretin and VIP can stimulate the pancreas to release bicarb, in addition, there are Brunner's glands found in the duodenum that secrete bicarb in response to a meal. When the bicarb is released, it temporarily raises the pH in the duodenum and helps to alleviate the pain. The pain of duodenal ulcers may be worse at night, and this is because at night, as opposed to after a meal, the stomach is entirely empty, and this means that the ulcer is being bathed in acid and it can make the pain worse. Now, when you see an ulcer on endoscopy, what you have to worry about is that that ulcer may contain cancer cells. And as we'll talk about when we get to the stomach, many gastric ulcers are a result of stomach cancer. This is not the case, however, in the duodenum. Duodenal ulcers are almost never cancerous. They're almost always benign. And in fact, when they're seen on endoscopy, they're rarely biopsied because the risk of cancer is so low. There's a phenomenon that occurs in the duodenum in patients with peptic ulcer disease that is high yield to know about for step one, and that is hypertrophy of the Brunner's glands. These glands are found only in the duodenum. They're found in the submucosa. This is a picture of a Brunner's gland shown on the screen here. You can see that it is just below the muscular layer of the mucosa in the submucosa. And Brunner's glands produce alkaline or basic fluid, and this protects the duodenum from acidic stomach fluid and chyme coming from the stomach. And in patients with peptic ulcer disease, because their duodenum is constantly exposed to a high level of acid, you will see increased thickness of the Brunner's glands on biopsy specimens. There are some complications of duodenal ulcers that you should know about, and the first thing to appreciate is that most duodenal ulcers occur in the anterior portion of the duodenum. However, ulcers that are found on the posterior wall are more likely to have complications. One of the complications they can cause is upper GI bleeding. Duodenal ulcers may cause bleeding, and this is more common when they're located posteriorly, and one of the reasons for this is that the gastroduodenal artery runs just behind the posterior wall of the duodenum. This means that posterior ulcers can erode into this artery and then cause GI bleeding. The pancreas is also located just behind the posterior duodenal wall, so a posterior ulcer can erode into the pancreas and cause pancreatitis. And then finally, any duodenal ulcer can potentially perforate. Let me pause and mention a word on upper GI bleeding. Upper GI bleeding is bleeding into the GI tract from a source above or proximal to the ligament of trites. This results in hematemesis or vomiting of blood or coffee ground material. This can be caused by peptic ulcers, although there are many other causes of upper GI bleeding. Patients with upper GI bleeding typically develop melena or dark stools. This is because as the blood passes through the GI tract, it is exposed to acid and bacteria. This turns the stools dark black or tarry. And this is in contrast to patients who have lower GI bleeding from a source below the ligament of trites. Those patients present with hematochesia, which is described as bright red blood per rectum. This is a picture of the duodenum and the ligament of trites attaches broadly to the duodenum and then attaches like an apron to the back of the abdominal wall and it suspends the distal duodenum. So any bleeding source that occurs above or proximal to the ligament of trites will cause upper GI bleeding. Sources below or distal to the ligament of trites cause lower GI bleeding. I mentioned ulcer perforation before. This can occur with either a gastric or duodenal ulcer and it classically causes pneumoperitoneum which is air in the peritoneum. This will appear as air under the diaphragm of chest x-ray. If you look at this chest x-ray on the screen, you can see a black space under the diaphragm on the right side of the body. That is evidence of something perforated in the abdomen, and it can be seen in patients who have perforation of ulcers. Now let's talk about gastric ulcers. So these are much less common than duodenal ulcers, and the most common location is the lesser curvature of the stomach. 
If you look at this picture on the screen, this is the greater curvature of the stomach. This is the lesser curvature. The lesser curvature is where gastric ulcers typically occur. And if they rupture through the wall of the stomach, they can cause bleeding from the left gastric artery. And that's because the left gastric artery courses along the lesser curvature of the stomach. In contrast to duodenal ulcers, the pain in gastric ulcers is typically worse with meals, not better. And that's because food stimulates acid release and thus the ulcer in the stomach gets exposed to more acid after a meal. And this can sometimes lead to fear of eating and weight loss. About 70% of gastric ulcers are associated with chronic H. pylori infection. And this is different from duodenal ulcers, where it's nearly 100%. And the dangerous cause of a gastric ulcer is stomach cancer or adenocarcinoma. And for this reason, when you see an ulcer in the stomach, they are often biopsied and sent to the pathology lab. And the reason is because you want to exclude adenocarcinoma, since that is a possible cause of a gastric ulcer. Many of the complications of gastric ulcers are similar to those of duodenal ulcers. They can perforate, just like duodenal ulcers. They can also cause upper GI bleeding. I mentioned this before, but the classic vessel is the left gastric artery. Here's a picture from our GI blood supply module. I just want to emphasize this point because it's high yield for step one. This is the lesser curvature of the stomach. This is where gastric ulcers typically occur. They can erode through and encounter this blood vessel running along the length of the lesser curvature. And that blood vessel is the left gastric artery, which will eventually anastomose with the right gastric artery. The treatment of ulcers, whether duodenal or gastric, is to treat the H. pylori infection when the bacteria is identified, and then to administer proton pump inhibitors. These are the therapy of choice. They will lower the acid content in the stomach and the duodenum and allow the ulcer to heal. In fact, proton pump inhibitors are often used empirically for patients with dyspepsia symptoms, and that's because they treat not only ulcers but also GERD and gastritis, which can cause dyspepsia. So rather than doing an endoscopy and a complicated workup, the patient will be administered proton pump inhibitors, and if they get better, you can consider the condition treated. Now we're going to talk about gastric carcinoma or stomach cancer. 95% of cases are adenocarcinoma. This is a very bad cancer. It's usually asymptomatic until it's advanced. The symptoms are usually nonspecific, things like weight loss, abdominal pain, and early satiety. If you have the cancer identified early and it is non-invasive, the five-year survival is excellent, about 95%. And there's a lot of gastric cancer in Japan, so they do a lot of screening and they identify a lot of cases early and they have fairly good five-year survival. Unfortunately, if you wait until the symptoms develop, the patients often have advanced cancer and at that point, the five-year survival drops to 15%. And there are two types, the intestinal type and the diffuse type, and we'll talk about them both in the next few slides. The intestinal type of stomach cancer looks like an ulcer. It will appear as a large ulcer with irregular margins. This is an example of one on the screen. You can see it's a big ulcer. It has very irregular margins. And if you see something like this on endoscopy, it's a very concerning finding. This type of cancer is similar to adenocarcinoma of the colon. It results from intestinal metaplasia, as we discussed before, and it can occur in response to H. pylori infection or autoimmune gastritis. And it's common in the lesser curvature, and that's easy to remember because that's where ulcers form, so it's also where ulcer-looking cancers can form, like the intestinal type of gastric cancer. Let's talk about some of the risk factors for gastric cancer. First of all, you should always remember that this cancer is more common among older men. That's the classic demographic. Gastric cancer is associated with smoking, just like many other forms of cancer. Interestingly, even though alcohol can cause gastritis, the association between alcohol and gastric cancer is very weak. Some studies have found a weak association. Other studies have found no association. So if you're asked about the most important risk factor for gastric cancer on a board exam, usually alcohol is not the right answer, and that's because the association is inconsistent. And then let me also mention that you will note that NSAIDs are not listed on this slide, and that's on purpose. That's because NSAID-type drugs, although they can cause gastritis, have never been found to be associated with gastric cancer. In fact, some studies have found a protective effect of NSAIDs, meaning patients who take these drugs are less likely to develop gastric cancer. The reason for this association is not known. There are two peculiar risk factors for gastric cancer that you should know about. One is consumption of substances called nitrosamines. These are substances that have a nitrogen double bonded to an oxygen attached to a nitrogen. This is an example of the structure of a nitrosamine on the screen. The most common one in the foods we eat is called NDMA, which stands for nitrosodimethylamine, and it's found in smoked meats, also bacon and sausage and ham. And consumption of large numbers of these foods have been linked to gastric cancer by case control studies. Second odd risk factor for gastric cancer is type A blood. There appears to be an increased risk of autoimmune gastritis 
in patients who are type A, and they can go on to develop carcinoma. The mechanism for this association is not clear. The other type of gastric cancer is the diffuse type. This is less common. It is not associated with metaplasia or chronic gastritis or H. pylori. It unfortunately has few established risk factors and occasionally causes cancer in otherwise healthy people. It's called the diffuse type because the stomach is diffusely thickened. Unlike the intestinal type, which can look like a focal ulcer, in this type, the entire stomach is involved and thickened. For this reason, early satiety is a common symptom. The patient basically always feels like they have a full stomach because it is full of cancer cells. When the stomach is removed, the characteristic pathology finding is called linitis plastica. This is when the stomach is thickened like leather. This cancer derives from gastric mucosa cells, and the classic finding on biopsy is the presence of cells called signet ring cells. This is a picture of a signet ring. You've probably seen people wearing these. Partially it is circular, but then it has a flat portion. And that's what the cells look like in the diffuse type of gastric cancer. Mucin forms inside the cells. Remember, they're derived from gastric mucosa cells, and the nucleus is pushed to the periphery. This is a picture of a signet ring cell on the screen. You can see that there is mucin in the middle, pushing the nucleus to the side, and it looks somewhat like the signet ring picture I've shown on the screen. The most common site of metastasis for stomach cancer is the liver, and that is also true of many other abdominal malignancies. That makes it easy to remember. One of the things I've always found fascinating about gastric cancer is that it has a number of skin and lymph node findings which are associated with the malignancy. And if you ever see these on a patient, you should suspect that they could have an underlying gastric cancer. The first finding is called acanthosis nigricans. This is the presence of hyperpigmented plaques on the skin. It characteristically occurs at areas where the skin is folded. These are called interigenous sites. Classically, it occurs in the neck and on the axilla. This is a picture of a patient's armpit or axilla, and you can see this darkened spot right here. That is a patch of acanthosis nigricans. This finding on the skin is associated with insulin resistance. You will see it in your clinic patients sometimes when they are obese or they have diabetes. However, it is also rarely associated with malignancy, and when it is associated with malignancy, gastric adenocarcinoma is the most common cancer. Another skin finding is called the lesser trilat sign. This is the explosive onset of multiple itchy seborrheic keratoses. This is a picture of a patient with multiple seborrheic keratoses, and if you see someone suddenly develop this, you should think that they may have gastric carcinoma. It is probably triggered by cytokines, and it's associated with many malignancies, but once again, gastric cancer is the most common association. A Verkhaus node is an enlarged left supraclavicular lymph node. This is the lymph node that drains lymph from the stomach, so it can become enlarged in metastatic gastric cancer. And if you ever meet a patient with an isolated enlargement of the left supraclavicular lymph node, that is an ominous finding that suggests they may have underlying metastatic gastric cancer. A Sister Mary Joseph nodule is a palpable nodule around the umbilicus seen on physical exam. This occurs when there are metastases from the stomach to the periumbilical region. A Kruckenberg tumor is a tumor of the ovaries that is not due to an ovarian problem, but is secondary to METs from another site. And the most common other site is the stomach due to gastric adenocarcinoma. This often presents with abdominal pain, and a CAT scan is done, and the woman is found to have bilateral enlargement of the ovaries. Sometimes she is taken to surgery, and when the ovaries are removed, it is determined that the pathology is not primary to the ovaries, but is a metastasis from another site, usually from the stomach. And this typically occurs with a diffuse type of gastric carcinoma. So what will be seen on pathology after the ovaries are removed are the presence of signet cells, and that will suggest that the primary tumor actually lies in the stomach, not in the ovaries. So we've talked a lot in this module about dyspepsia and causes of abdominal pain and upset stomach. However, only about 25% of patients who present to a physician with dyspepsia have an organic cause. Many of them have what's known as functional dyspepsia, meaning they have an upset stomach and epigastric pain, but their stomach and intestines are entirely normal. However, as we have seen, dyspepsia may also be due to gastritis and ulcers and cancer and H. pylori. So how are you going to deal with this clinically? You don't want to refer every patient with an upset stomach for an endoscopy. Well, shown on the screen is an algorithm of the type that is typically used clinically to work up patients with dyspepsia. If they present with new onset dyspepsia and they are older, which places them at risk for gastric cancer, or if they have alarm symptoms like weight loss and early satiety, then they are referred immediately for an endoscopy, which is called an EGD. However, if they are younger and they have no alarm symptoms, then you can test them for H. pylori. Usually this is done with a stool antigen test. If the test is positive, you offer them treatment with H. pylori therapy. If the test is negative, you can treat them empirically with a proton pump inhibitor. And the reason this is done is because proton pump inhibitors treat heartburn and gastritis and ulcers and many of the common causes of dyspepsia. 
Now, if the patient fails to respond to H. pylori therapy or if they don't get better on the proton pump inhibitor, then they can be sent for an endoscopy to exclude other causes and try to make an organic diagnosis. The last topic I'll discuss in this module are disorders that fall under the heading of hypertrophic gastropathy. These are rare disorders that cause enlarged rugal folds. They are caused by hyperplasia. These are not inflammatory disorders. They're somewhat analogous to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you look at this CAT scan on the screen, you can see an enormous stomach with very large rugal folds. And this is what you see in patients with hypertrophic gastropathy. All of these disorders are rare, but one of them that is worth knowing for step one is called Menetrae's disease. This is an acquired disorder of the stomach of unknown cause. It's much more common in men, three times more common in men than in women. And the hallmark of Menetrae's disease is hyperplasia of the mucus cells in the stomach. As a result, there are excessive gastric mucus secretions. This neutralizes the acid of the stomach, and there's loss of acid in the stomach, which is called achlorhydria. And as a result of all that mucus into the stomach that pours out into the GI tract, patients with Menetrae's disease lose protein. This is called a protein-losing enteropathy. As a result of the loss of protein, these patients develop hypoalbuminemia, and this means they will present with edema and facial swelling. So the typical case of Menetrae's disease will be someone with abdominal pain and edema and facial swelling. There will be low albumin levels on serum testing and a CAT scan of the abdomen will show a very large stomach like you saw on the last slide. And because of the hyperplasia in the stomach, there is an increased risk of gastric adenocarcinoma in patients with Menetrae's disease. And that concludes our module on gastric disorders.